This is the story of Air Transat Flight 236. On the 24th of August 2001, an Air Transat A330 was on its way from Toronto Pearson International Airport to Lisbon in Portugal. The plane had 293 passengers on board and 13 crew members. The captain was the one at the controls. The plane departed Toronto at 12.52 a.m. UTC with almost 47 tons or 94,000 pounds of fuel, which was more than enough for the trip. It was just supposed to be another regular flight. As the plane crossed 20 degrees west, something came up. At 5.03 a.m. UTC, they started seeing unusual oil indications in the right engine, that is engine number two. The anomaly was reported to the people on the ground at Mirabelle, Canada. At 5.33 a.m., the crew got an advisory warning on the right engine. While troubleshooting this error, they pulled up the fuel page and they realized that they had a fuel imbalance. They had a fuel imbalance between the left and the right inner wing tanks. To correct this imbalance, they started feeding the right engine from the left-hand tanks. At 5.45 a.m. UTC, their fuel level got so low that they could not make it to Lisbon anymore. They now had to divert. It was their only option. They were now aiming to land at Lages Airport in the Azores. At this point, they had 7 tons or 15,000 pounds of fuel left. This was perplexing, and so the pilots asked the crew members to look out of the windows to see if they could see a stream of fuel from the right wing. But in the darkness, they could not see anything. At 5.54 a.m., the crew, now faced with a situation in which fuel was disappearing right in front of their eyes, decided to feed both engines from the right fuel tank. Faced with fuel values that made no sense, they contacted the maintenance crew on the ground. They had 4.7 tons of fuel right now. This was 12 tons below the planned value. They suspected a fuel leak in the right inner tanks. The situation was bad. As they talked to maintenance techs on the ground, the fuel quantities in the tank had gone down by 1 ton and 3.2 tons in the right tank. The maintenance technicians suggested that there might be a leak in the left-hand engine, and the captain momentarily opted to feed the engines from the left tanks. They had now 1.1 tons of fuel on board. At 6.13 a.m. UTC, the worst-case scenario started to unfurl. At 39,000 feet, the right engine failed. With 150 miles to go to get to Lajas, they were in a really tough spot. They could no longer maintain 39,000 feet with one engine. After letting Santa Maria Control know, they started a descent. It was now 6.15 a.m. UTC. The pilots reported that they had 600 kilos of fuel on board. At 6.23 a.m., it was obvious that things were going to get worse before they got better, and so the first officer declared a mayday. Three minutes later, the left engine flamed out. They were at 34,500 feet, and they had 65 miles to Lajas. They prepped the plane to glide as best as they could, and they headed for Lajas as a glider. 6.31 a.m., they were about 8 nautical miles from runway 33 and at 13,000 feet. They were too high. The captain let approach know that he was going to conduct a left 360 degree turn to lose altitude. The turn was conducted with the landing gear and the slats out. They did an orbit, but they were still a bit too high. As they were on final approach, the captain flew S-turns to lose some of that extra altitude. 6.45 a.m., they zoomed past the runway threshold at 200 knots well above what an A330 usually lands at, but Flight 236 had no other options. They touched down hard, 1,000 feet down the runway. They bounced and touched down again, 2,800 feet down the runway. Once firmly on the ground, maximum braking was applied and the plane came to stop 7,600 feet down the 10,000 foot runway. The plane was evacuated at once, and a few people did sustain a few injuries, but I'm pleased to say that everyone survived. An A330 just does not run out of fuel in midair. Looking back into the maintenance history of the airplane, they found out that the right engine had been replaced on the 17th of August 2001, a Friday. Repairs were supposed to take until Sunday. When the lead technician came in on Sunday, he found that he could not fit the rear hydraulic pump into the engine. A high-pressure fuel pump line stood in the way. It was at this point that the technician realized that the engine was in a pre-SB or service bulletin configuration, 
On the 21st of April 1999, Airbus put out an optional service bulletin for the Rolls-Royce engines that were installed on the plane. There had been a few cases of hydraulic fluid leakage from the hydraulic pumps and the lines, and this service bulletin was to fix that issue. They added a wider hydraulic pump and replaced three fuel tubes and two hydraulic tubes. But the problem was that Air Transat and practically every other North American carrier operated A330s with engines in the post-SB configuration. In order to figure out what to do, the lead technician tried to access the service bulletins, but they could not because of a network error. So the technician contacted the maintenance control center, who in turn contacted Air Transat's Trent engine controller. As they waited for the engine controller to call back, they tried accessing the service bulletin in another way, but still, no luck. When the engine controller called back, he let them know that the earlier pump had issues with vibrations and that the new pump interfered with the fuel lines, and so they would need to be replaced. The controller asked them to verify that there was space between the components after they had done removing and replacing everything. So, the fuel assembly was taken out of the old engine and it was installed on the new engine. The different shape and the routing of the fuel tubes solved the issue of the hydraulic pump not fitting in. But the hydraulic tubes were never replaced. The hydraulic tubes were still to the pre-SB standards, so when they tried to achieve some separation between the fuel and the hydraulic lines, as the engine controller had suggested, they found out that the hydraulic tube had a tendency to snap back into place when it was pressurized. But nonetheless, they tightened some bolts and the required separation was achieved on the ground. The investigators found tool marks on the tubes, but the technicians denied using tools to separate the tubes. So now this engine was sort of a Frankenstein engine. The pumps and the fuel lines were from a newer engine, and the hydraulic lines were from the older engine. There were post-installation inspections by Tex and an independent contractor, but the inspections were not at the level that they could detect this flaw. So now when the engine was in flight, the hydraulic lines would be pressurized, and so the hydraulic line moved around a bit. This caused both the hydraulic line and the fuel line to come into contact with each other, and it ended up chafing the fuel line, which eventually led to the fuel line rupturing mid-flight on the accident flight. Now we have half of the story. We now know where the fuel went, but this was not a small leak by any means. This was a leak that dumped 13 tons or 30,000 pounds of fuel overboard in one hour. How did the crew not notice this? The first sign of trouble was just a simple oil warning. This was due to the rate of flow of the fuel in the fuel oil heat exchanger. This would not warn the crew about a fuel leak. The fuel leak started at 4.38 a.m. and the fuel leak was not noticed until 5.33 a.m. when the fuel advisory popped up. As the fuel was draining away, they had lots of signs in the cockpit to realize that they were losing fuel. The gauges for one and the calculated fuel that they'd have at the destination kept falling as well. So why didn't the crew pick up on these cues? They did a required fuel check at 4.58 a.m. And when they did that fuel check, the fuel they had on board was only 1% less than the fuel that they should have had. So that didn't really raise any alarms. In addition to that, they were busy with position reporting and data logging. Moreover, the warning added some uncertainty into the cockpit atmosphere, and after that, they were busy contacting the MCC or the maintenance center. The oil warning just turned their attention away from the fuel gauges. At this point, fuel from a trim tank was being loaded into the right wing tank, and this masked the fuel leak for a while. Once the crew got to know about the fuel imbalance, which was caused by the ruptured line in the right-hand engine, they promptly did the fuel balancing procedure from the QRH, or the Quick Reference Handbook, from memory. At this point, the left tanks were feeding both engines and the leak in the right engine. But when they did this check from memory, they forgotten one important side note. The fuel imbalance checklist had this little asterisk to it. Quote, in the event that a fuel leak is suspected, the fuel leak procedure should be done, end quote. After they did this checklist, the delta between the fuel that they had on board and the fuel that they were supposed to have was seven tons. They now had to figure out why this was.
They reviewed documents to see if they had made an error fueling the plane or something like that. Their documents had no errors. They looked at fuel flow numbers to see if the engines were consuming more fuel than they should. No problems there as well. And the aircraft didn't feel or sound like it had a structural problem. So when the ECAM system warned them about a fuel imbalance, they just instinctively carried out that checklist as they had in simulations. This is an isolated incident. In 1997, an Air France A320 had a leak and the crew carried out a fuel imbalance checklist. So what should the crew have done? They should have taken a look at all of the data. Had they done that, they would have seen that they were missing about 7 tons of fuel and they would have looked up the procedure in the QRH. They would have been forced to think about a fuel leak and the checklist would have instructed them to close the crossfeed valve that was sending fuel from the left hand tanks into the leak in the right hand engine. Had this happened, they would have been able to make a powered landing at Lages. They eventually did isolate the left hand tanks from the leak in the right hand engine, but by then it was too little, too late. When they finally did divert to the Azores, almost 10 tons or 22,000 pounds of fuel had been lost. At this point, they were in contact with maintenance control, and the report calls these non-critical communications, and it slowed down their reactions to the ECAM warnings that the plane was giving them. Keep in mind, at this point, they did doubt the fuel readings a bit. They suspected that the fuel data that they saw were corrupted or erroneous. When the right engine flamed out, they were in for a rude awakening. The data that they were seeing was correct. From here on out, the crew did an amazing job. They were at the top of their game. The captain's handling of the plane during the approach was, quote, remarkable. He did not have a lot of instruments. Pitch was limited, and this was the first time he had attempted anything like this. So, in the end, what changed? Warnings were made less ambiguous. In this case, had they had an early warning that said, you have a fuel issue, it could have stopped all of this from happening. Moreover, a fuel advisory was a low-level warning at best. Sure, it hinted to a serious problem, but the warning itself? It wasn't that serious. It did not convey the severity of the issue. Training was also improved, and so were the checklists. Pilots are now well equipped to identify and react to a fuel leak. Also, the computers were made smarter. In this case, the fuel in the trim tank was being piped into the right-hand tanks. The computers can now recognize anomalous transfers like these and warn pilots. These were just some of the ways in which flying is now safer thanks to Air Transat Flight 236. Sure, these pilots made a few mistakes, but their flying was nothing short of remarkable. And for their extraordinary flying, Captain Pichet was given the Superior Airmanship Award. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It'll really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.